Welcome, everybody. Today we have Joanna Hardis. Joanna wrote an amazing book called Just Do Nothing, a paradoxical guide to getting out of your way. It was a solid gold read. Welcome, Joanna. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for reading it, too. I appreciate it. It was a wonderful read and so on point, like science backed. It was so good. So, it, yeah, you should be so proud. Thank you. Why did you choose the title Just Do Nothing? Well, I mean, it's super catchy, but more importantly than that, it is really what my work involves on a personal level and on a professional level is learning how to get out of my own way or our own way by leaving our thoughts alone, learning how to leave uncomfortable feelings alone, uncomfortable sensations alone, uncomfortable thoughts alone. Yeah. Because that's what creates the suffering is when we get so engaged in them. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a hard lesson. I talk about this with patients all the time. But as I mentioned to you, I even my therapist is constantly saying, like, you're going to have to just feel this one. And my instinct is to go, nope, no thanks. There has to be another way. There has 100%. to be. Yes. Yes. I mean, it really is something on a daily basis I I have to remind myself and work really hard to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It is. And it's such but it is such powerful work when you do it. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Early in the book, you talk about this term or this concept called distress tolerance or distress intolerance. Can you mm-hmm. tell us what both of those are and and give us some some ideas on why this is an important topic? Sure. And this is this is what got me interested in 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 the book and everything. So dist- and distress tolerance is a perception that you can handle negative internal states. And those internal states can be, you know, that you feel anxious, that you feel worried, you feel bored, vulnerable, ashamed, angry, sad, mad, off. You know, there's an A to Z alphabet of those unpleasant and uncomfortable emotional states. And when you we have that perception that we can handle it, our behavior aligns. So we we tend to do things. When we are distressed intolerant, we have a perception, often incorrect, that we cannot handle in negative internal states. And so then we will either avoid them or escape them or try to figure them out or neutralize them or try to get rid of them, make them stop. All the things that we see in our work every day um, but that I also, before before I had my practice in anxiety disorders, I worked over a decade in an eating disorder treatment center. And we know that when someone has really low distress tolerance, they are more vulnerable to developing eating disorders, anxiety disorders, depressive disorders, substance use disorders. So it's a really important concept. It's such an important concept. And you talk about you talk about how we the thoughts we have, which can determine that. Um, mm. Do you want to share a little bit about that? Because there was like a whole chapter in the book about the thoughts you have about your ability to tolerate the stress. Sure. And I didn't answer the second part of your question, I just realized, which will tie into that, which is how it sounds. Yeah. Yeah. So how it sounds is I can't bear to feel, I can't bear to feel this way. So I'm going to avoid that party. Or, you know, I can't possibly, I'm having too good of a day. So I can't do, so I can't do my homework. Or I can't, I can't bear if my kids see me anxious, so we're not going to go to the playground. Mm. And so what drives someone's perception 
are their thoughts and, and these thoughts and these self-limiting stories that we all have and that oftentimes we just buy into as either true or perhaps at one point they may have been true, but we've outlived them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we're talking about distress tolerance and, and I'm always on the hunt to sort of widen my distress tolerance, to be able to tolerate higher levels of distress. Um, and I think what's interesting is, first, if this is more of a question that, you you know, I don't know the science behind it, but do you think that some people have higher levels of distress, which makes them more intolerant? Or do you think the intolerance, which is what makes the distress feel so painful? Mm, I, I don't know the research well enough to answer it. Yeah. Because I think it's rare that you see, I mean, this is just one construct. Yeah. So it's very hard to to isolate it from something like emotional sensitivity, yeah, or or anxiety sensitivity, or intolerance for uncertainty, or something else that may be contributing to yeah. it. Yeah. No, I know it's just a question I often think about, particularly when That's I'm with patients. Of you know, it, it's it's a. And this is something that I think it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. What matters is, you know, and maybe this will be a question for you. If our goal is to increase our distress tolerance, how might somebody even begin to navigate that? Sure. I love that question. I mean, in the book, I take it down to such a micro level, which is, you know, learning how, and I think you've talked about it on podcasts, itch surf. Mm -hmm. So one of the exercises in the book is learning how you set your timer for five minutes and you get itchy, which of course is going to happen. And, and it's learning how to ride out that urge to scratch the itch. And what ha you know so paying attention to if you zoom in on the itch what happens what happens when you zoom out what else can you pay attention to what and so when someone learns that that process that is on such a micro level i often tell patients it's like a 1 pound weight yes and then what are some 2 pound weights that people can use. So then for many people, it's their phone. So it's perhaps not checking notifications that come in right away. So they begin to practice in low distress situations because I want people to get confident that they know how to zoom in, they know how to zoom out, they know how, you know, if they're feeling a sensation, the more that they pay attention to it, the worse it's going to feel. And so how else can they like place, where else can they put their awareness? What else can they be doing? And once they get the hang of it, we introduce more and more distress. So then it might be their phone. Then it might be them intentionally calling up a thought. And we, and we work up that way with adding, you know, and very gradually more distress or more discomfort. You know, exercise is a great way to get people, especially if it's not married to anxiety, to get people interacting with it differently. Yeah. Yeah. We use this all the time with anxiety disorders. Um, you know, it's a, it's a different language because we talk about like an ERP hierarchy or, you know, your exposure mm -hmm. menu and so forth. But I, I love that in the book, it's not just specific to that. It could be like you talked about, like um, it, it's for those who have depression, it's those who have grief, it's those who have eating disorders, it's those who have anger. And I think, I mean, I will even say the the concept of distress tolerance to me is so interesting because there's so many areas of my life where I can practice it. Like, you know, the, uh, my urgency to like nag my kids another time to, you know, oh, get out the door in time. And I have to catch like, 
you don't need to say it the third time. Like, can you tolerate your own discomfort about the, the time it's taking them to get out the door? And I think that when we have that attitudinal shift, it, it, it's so helpful. Yes. And don't you think parenting, I find parenting is the hardest, one of the hardest places for me. <laughs> <laughs> keeping, but it was also like a reminder, like the more I keep my mouth shut, the better. Yeah. I, and I think that's really where I was talking before. Like it, it, I found parenting to be quite a triggering process as my kids have gotten older, but so many opportunities for my own personal growth using this exact scenario, like your fear might come up and you're like, instead of you know, engaging in that fear, I'm actually just going to let it be there and feel it and parent according to my values um, or act according to my values. Um, and I, I, I've i truly found this to be such a valuable tool. Yes. And I, what I have found what's been really interesting, when my kids were at home, that was where my distress was. Now that there are two of the three are out of the house. Now my distress is when we're all together that everyone have a good time. Mm, mm. And so it's like, it, it, and so it, it, it morphs, you know, because what I tell myself and my perception and like the urgency, it changes. It's still so difficult with them, but it changes based on what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, and I think this is an opportunity for everyone too, is how much do you feel that awareness piece is important of being aware of that you are triggered? So like I said, you could be, for the folks listening, of course, you're on Anxiety Toolkit Podcast. Most are listening because they have anxiety. Um, do you encourage them to be aware of other areas they can be practicing this? Yes. <laughs> talk, can you talk to me about that? 100%. Because I feel like it, it, it's like, un, it's, what is that the metaphor about the onion? It's like the layers of an onion. So people will come and they'll think it's about their anxiety. But this is really about any uncomfortable feeling or uncomfortable sensation. And so it may be that they're bored or vulnerable or embarrassed or something else. So once someone learns how to allow those feelings and do what they what is important to them or what they need to do while they feel it, then yes, I want them to go and notice where else in their life this is showing up. Okay. Talk to me specifically about the how in real time. So I know, because I know that's what listeners are going to ask. Of course. Okay. Um, I have this scary thing I want to be able to do, but I don't want to do it because I'm scared and I don't want to feel scared. How might someone practice tolerating their distress in real time? Sure. I mean, so I'm going to answer it two ways. One, I would say that might be something to scale. So sometimes people want to do the thing because mm -hmm. the doing the thing is the set. It's like the goal or the sexy thing. But if it's outside of their window of tolerance, they're not going to be able to, you know, they may not be able to do it. So it depends what they want to do. So I might say as just a preface, this might be something that people should consider scaling. Mm. Gradual, so, you mean? Yes. So for instance, they want to go to the gym, but they're scared of, you know, they're, they want to go to the gym, but they're scared of fainting on the treadmill or something. Pretty common for what we see. You know, it, it would be like scale it back. So it might be you know, going to the parking lot. It might be taking a tour. It might be going and standing on the treadmill. It might be walking on the treadmill. It might be, but we have to put it in smaller pieces. In the moment that we're doing something that is that is difficult, first we have to notice if we're starting to grip. 
So I use this, the, the, if we're starting to grip something. So if we're starting to zoom in on how much, what we don't like, if we're starting to zoom in on a sensation we don't like, a thought we don't like, a feeling we don't like, I want people to notice that. And, and you get better at noticing it faster. So the first thing is you got to notice it, that it's happening, because that's going to make it worse. So you want to be able to notice it. You want to be able to loosen your grip on it. So that might be finding what else like is going on in my surroundings. So I'm on the treadmill, you know, I'm walking, maybe a faster pace, and I'm noticing that my, you know, my heart rate is going up. And I'm starting to zoom into that. What else, what else am I noticing? Or what else am I hearing? What else do I see? What else, what else is going on around me? Can we make something else a louder voice? And so every time that my brain wants to go back to self heart focus, it's like, no, no, like what, you know, taking it back to something else that's going on. And, you know, it helps to connect with why is this important to do? So as I'm continuing to say, you know, every, you know, I'm okay, I am safe, I'm listening, I'm focusing on my music, and I'm looking out the window, and this is really important to do because my health is important, my recovery is important. So it becomes that you're connecting to something that's important and the focus is not on what we don't like because that's going to make it bigger and stronger. Right. As you're doing that, as we've already kind of mentioned, someone might be having those can't thoughts, like I can't handle it, even if it's within their window of tolerance, right? It's yeah. reasonable and it's um, it's a it's an appropriate exposure and it's appropriate. Yeah. How might they m manage this sort of ongoing, you can't do this, this is too hard, you, you know, it's too much, you can't handle it kind of thinking? I like, this may suck and I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny I will tell you it's hilarious in the very beginning of the book you sort of make some comments about like the catchphrases and how you hate them and and so forth and I always laugh because we have a catchphrase over here but it's, it's so similar to that in that we always talk about like it's a beautiful day to do hard yes. things and yeah. that seems to be so helpful for people but I do think sometimes we do get fed like you know, over positive ways of, you know, you have a negative thought. So we respond very positively, right? Yes. And so I, I like like, this is going to suck and I'm going to do it anyway. Yes. So you're acknowledging this may suck. Like, especially if you're deconditioned, especially if you're scared, especially like it may suck. And, and I always tell people not the but, and I can do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Even, uh -huh, even in 30 second increments. So if someone is like, I can't, I can't, I'll say you can do anything for 30 seconds. So, yeah. so then we like pile on 30 seconds. Yeah. And that's such an important piece of it too, which is just taking a temporary mindset of we can just do this for a little tiny bit and then a little tiny bit and then a little tiny bit. Yes. I love that. I love yeah. that. Yeah. So why does any why do we do this what what's what's the draw what's this like sell me on why someone wants to do this work to do uh, to do tolerance hard... well, like why probably... why would somebody i mean we talk about this all the time like why do we want to widen our distress to tolerance oh my goodness oh my gosh i think once you realize all the little areas that it may be impacting one's life, it, it it's sort of like, it, it just blows your mind. I mean, but I think if for, in a practical sense, I think it can really get, and people can stay stuck. When people are stuck, 
this is often a piece. I'm not going to, it's absolutely not the whole reason people are stuck, but this is such a piece of why people get stuck. And so I think for anyone that might feel stuck, perhaps, you know, they want a different job or they want to show up differently as a parent or they feel like they're a people pleaser or they're having trouble dating because they get super controlling. You know, it can show up in any area of one's life. Yeah. Yeah. For me, the se the selling point on why I want to do it is because it's sort of like a muscle is if I don't continue to grow this muscle, everything feels more and more scary. Oh, sure. Yeah, that's a great, that, that, right. Yes. Right. hundred percent. The, the more I kind of go into this mindset of like, you can't handle it and it's too much, and it's too scary. Things start to feel more scary. The world starts to feel more unsafe. Whereas that attitude shift, um, I, there's a there's a self trust that comes with it for me. Like I trust that I can handle things. Whereas if I'm in the mindset of like I can't, I have no self trust. I I don't trust that I can handle scary things. And then I'm constantly hyper vigilant, thinking like when's the next scary thing going to happen? Right, right. Mm -hmm. And if you never, I mean, another a reason to also practice doing it. If you never challenge it, you don't get the learning that you can do it. Yeah. Yeah, there's such empowerment with this this work. Yes, and you don't have to do, you know, big, scary. You don't have to jump out of an airplane to do it. Right. Or like pose naked or like because I see that on Instagram now, people who are conquering their fears by doing these very Instagram worthy tasks, which are very, could be very scary. We can do it just like you say with not nagging our kids mm. Mm. by say, by choosing, you know, where, what I want to make for dinner versus like making so many dinners because I am so scared that I can't handle if my kids are upset with me. Right. Right. Yeah. And for those who have anxiety, um, I think from the work I do with my patients is this idea of being uncertain feels intolerable. Mm -hmm. it, it, that feeling, you know, you're talking about these real life examples and for, and for those who are listening with anxiety, um, it, I get it. That feeling of uncertainty feels intolerable, but Again, that idea of widening your tolerance or or increasing your ability to tolerate it in ten second increments can stop you from engaging in compulsions that can make your your disorder worse or avoiding which can make your disorder worse. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? I a hundred percent agree with you. I always say, like, let's demote intolerable to uncomfortable. Yes. And, and because it, it I, I feel sometimes like I have to know I can't stand it. I'm crawling out of my skin. But if I'm then able to get some distance from it, it it's, you know, that's the urgency of anxiety. Yeah. 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 It's such and, beautiful work. Yes. And once you, especially the more people do, they're able to say, you know what, I can, I can do things. It may feel intolerable, that diffusion, you know, it may feel intolerable. It's probably uncomfortable. So yeah. what is the smallest next step I can take in this situation to, to do what I need to do and not make it worse? That's a big thing of mine is like not making a situation worse. Yes. Yes. And, and that's where the do nothing comes yes. in. Yes. Yes, that's the paradoxical part. Yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there any area of this that you feel like we haven't covered that, that's important to you that would be an important piece of this work that someone might consider as they're doing this work on their own? Well, I th think, uh, is there, 
I, th- I mean, I think, and I know that you are a big proponent of this too. I think it's very hard to do this work without some mindful awareness practice. Mm. So, and I talk about it in the book, what we, it's, it's just such an enhancer. It enhances any, it enhances treatment, but it also enhances our daily life. So I really am just, I can't say it strongly enough that it is so important for us to be able to notice when we are, this pattern, when we are saying, oh my gosh, I can't take this, or I can't do this, and then the behavior, and to think about, okay, you know, what's the function of me avoiding, but if we're so, if we're going so fast and our gas pedal is always to the floor, we don't have the opportunity to to notice. Yeah, the mindfulness piece is so huge, and even like you're saying, the mindfulness piece of also the awareness, but also the non judgment of yes in in mindfulness as you're doing the hard thing as you're de- you're tolerating distress you're not sitting there going this sucks and i hate it i mean you're saying like it will suck and that's i think validating it validates yeah. you but not staying in the this is the worst and i hate it and i shouldn't be here that's when this the ink that suffering does really show up yes yes yeah. yes mm. the situation may suck it doesn't mean i suck yeah that yeah. was a hard lesson to learn. But the situation may, but I don't have to pour gas on it by saying, how long is it going to last? Oh my gosh, it's this feeling's never going to end. Do I still feel it? Oh my gosh, do I still feel it as much? All the like things that I am pro- that I'm prone to do, my clients are prone to do that extend the suffering. Yeah. Make it worse. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question, actually, is that and I often will talk with my patients about it in the moment when they're in distress of like, sometimes writing it down, like, what can we do that would make this worse? What can we do that will make this better? Um, And sometimes that is doing nothing. And you do talk about that in the book. Yeah, 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 the forward and the backward. The choice points? Yes, yes, yes. Can you share just a little bit about that? So it's a concept from ACT, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, that says, you know, when we have a behavior, a behavior can either move us toward or forward toward what's important, what's meaningful, our values, or it can move us away from it. Mm. And so as we're thinking about doing whatever the hard thing may be, or it may not even be a hard thing, it just may be something you don't want to do thinking about, you know, what your why is, what's the forward move? Why is the forward move? Why might, why is it meaningful to you? What do you stand to get? What's on the other side? Because we are, most of us are well-versed in, if we give in, that's an away move. And we have to be able to do this non-judgmentally because some days it's just it's just not in us and that's totally fine. But I want people to be honest with themselves and non-judgmental about, about whatever decisions they make. But it does help to have a reason that moves us forward. Absolutely. I think that's such an important piece of the work. Again, that's the selling point of why we would want to be uncomfortable. There's a, there's a goal or a why that gets yeah. us there. Yeah. 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 And yeah. it's amazing how much pain we will put up. I mean, think about like all the things people like waxing and like some of these exercise classes and just like, it's amazing because it's important to someone. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's a great point too, which is we do tolerate distress every day when we really are clear on what we want. And and yes. that's, I think sometimes we have this thing of like, I can't handle it, but it's like, you might even ask like, what are some harder things that I've actually tolerated in my lifetime? Yes, exactly. Because there's a lot of things you're so right that we do that are uncomfortable, but yeah. it's worth it because for whatever reason, it's worth it. Yeah. Yeah, I love this. Um, I have loved chatting with you. Is there anything, I know I've sort of asked you this already, but is there any final words you want to share before we learn more about you and where people can get in touch with you? 
Um, I just want people to know that anybody can do this. That yeah. that it, it may be that it's just creating a uh, uh, the right scale, the small enough step forward, but anybody can work on this. Yeah. And the, you know, there is so many areas and ways in which we can strengthen this muscle. And so there is hope. No one is broken. No one is. It may be that people just don't know the next best move. Right. I love that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Where can people hear more about you and get in touch with you? Sure. Uh, well, my website prob is probably at, so it's joannahardis.com. And my Instagram is the same thing at Joanna Hardis. And excitingly, the book just came out in audio yesterday. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Thank That's you. Wonderful. And we can get the book wherever books are sold. Wherever books are sold. Yes. Yeah. I really do encourage people to buy it. I think it's a it's a book you could pick up and read once a year. And I think that there's messages. You know what I'm saying? There are some books where you could just revisit and take something from. So um, I would really encourage people to buy the book and, and just dabble in the many concepts that you share. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. This is such a, such a, a concept and a topic that I'm really passionate about in turn and for myself too. You know, I think it's, it's a, something I'll be working on until I'm 99. I think. Me too. I'm with you right there. <laughs> <laughs> it's always an opportunity where I'm like, oh, okay, there's another opportunity for me to grow. All right, let's let's get on board. Let's go back to the skills. So I, I think it's really wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me.